From 1929 through 2009, the historic Lake Champlain Bridge made it easy for travelers to cross the narrow passage between Crown Point, New York and Chimney Point, Vermont. It's something that connected people's lives uh, together across uh, New York and Vermont. The way it sat in that landscape and seemed to respond to the mountains around it and the lake over which it passed. Over the years, uh, people built up a great deal of affection for it. For most people alive today, that's all they've ever seen in, in that view shed is the Lake Champlain Bridge. And at night, you know, you always look for the lights over there on the bridge. My kids learned to swim over there, sort of to the left of the bridge as you went over. My grandchildren did. It had such a, an impact on our lives. My grandfather had a boat and we'd always go out fishing and we'd go up close to the bridge. I was always amazed by the size and complexity of it. For us, it's, it's a lifeline. It's been uh, very important to us for many years. Yeah. But after 80 years of service, the bridge would suddenly force the region to face a harsh reality. In the fall of 2009, the New York State Department of Transportation would discover that the piers supporting the bridge were no longer safe. The bridge would have to come down. We were all stunned, we couldn't believe it. The region would have to come together to restore this vital link over Lake Champlain. For at least 9,000 years, this crossing was one of the busiest along the 120 mile length of Lake Champlain. Right here, the two sides of the lake are only about 1,600 feet apart, with relatively easy approaches to the lake shore. Along the shore, archaeologists have found stone artifacts used by American Indian peoples since the retreat of the glaciers. We find stone material that comes from northern Canada. We find material that comes from Pennsylvania. We find materials that come from Maine, all there at Chimney Point sort of representing the evidence of the travels of people and the communication, the sharing of information with people living on the other side of the lake. The Abenaki people called Lake Champlain the Lake Between. The Iroquois called it the gateway to the country. But when Samuel de Champlain explored the lake in 1609, it signaled a new era of European influence. Like the Native Americans before them, the Europeans quickly recognized the strategic significance of Lake Champlain and the narrow passage between Crown Point and Chimney Point. By 1731, the French built a fort at Chimney Point. It was a fort of logs or Fort de Pieux. And from that point, there was, a, there was an established French presence there. Within just a few years, the French then built a stone fortification on the other side of the lake. Fort St. Frederick at Crown Point. The French held this position until the British drove them from the valley and built His Majesty's Fort at Crown Point, the largest 18th century fort in North America. Throughout the American Revolution, the crossing continued to serve as a strategic location. After the war, civilian population along the lakeshore increased enough to need a regular ferry service across the lake. The very first ferries were powered by sail. By the 1830s, a more reliable horse-powered ferry came to dominate the lake traffic. And by the 1850s, coal-powered steam ferries would speed the crossing even more. By the early 20th century, automobile traffic was increasing, and many people wanted to bridge the gap dividing the Adirondacks in New York from the Green Mountains of Vermont. A 1922 grassroots campaign rallied state, county, and community organizations to appeal to both state legislatures for a bridge across Lake Champlain. This is really an ambitious project. The whole process of two states adopting a joint compact to construct a bridge between the two states is unusual. In 1925, both New York and Vermont established in the Lake Champlain Commission. Each of the governors of the two states appointed three members of the commission to ultimately take ownership of the bridge 
supervise its maintenance and uh, oversee the financing for the bridge. Bonds were issued to pay for the construction. This investment would be repaid over time by toll revenues. After considering six locations, the commission decided to build where the lake's bedrock was most favorable. The bridge would span the historic and scenic narrow passageway between Chimney Point, Vermont, and Crown Point, New York. The Lake Champlain Commission was interested in having the bridge respond to the area's scenic qualities. They began inviting proposals from various engineering firms. The commission selected Boston engineers, Fay, Spofford, and Thorndike, for their innovative design solutions. Frederick Fay would oversee the construction of the bridge, and Charles Spofford was the lead designer. Blending the bridge with its landscape was only one of many challenges. The bridge had to be high enough to allow steamboats with tall smokestacks to pass underneath. Some bridge types were ruled out due to unfavorable soil conditions. A traditional truss bridge would be less expensive, providing better views of the lake from the bridge. But at that time, truss bridges did not have a graceful appearance. So, Spofford used an innovative approach. This was the first continuous truss that had a free form that essentially developed from really an underdeck truss to then almost an arch and then back to an underdeck truss. This was not only an unusual and beautiful form, but it was also a highly efficient form and a rather complex form to design. So he needed to create in many ways the math by which he could design a bridge, and you think about it, this is all prior to the computer. What's easy now was quite difficult then. Many design and construction challenges were surmounted in innovative ways. For example, the channel piers had to be built on bedrock, which was as much as 100 feet below the lake's surface. Construction firm Merritt, Chapman & Scott began working on the foundations in June 1928. They built a coffer dam all the way down to bedrock and used a steel frame to support that coffer dam. That steel frame became a series of steel cages and then the concrete was poured around those steel cages all the way up to a level slightly below the water level of the lake. And then uh, from that point on for those channel piers the coffer dams were pumped dry and the concrete was poured in that dry area. One of Spofford's innovative design ideas would prove problematic in later years. The aggregate used for the concrete piers consisted of iron ore tailings from mines in nearby Moriah, New York. I think Spofford uh, made an unusual decision, but, but somewhat justified. I think Spofford got the idea that this is good aggregate. Why don't we look at this for making uh, an extra durable concrete? And he, he was an MIT professor, did some tests at MIT, looked at uh, even the underwater performance and found that at that point it was so good that he decided that reinforcement wasn't necessary. From the perspective of the fragility of the bridge, now 80 years later, that contributed a great deal to the lack, let's say, of safety of the bridge. The fabrication and construction of the superstructure was completed by the American Bridge Company, one of the nation's leading steel bridge manufacturers at the time. The old bridge was built in a truss, which is uh, comprised of lots of little pieces with lots of rivets. Steel back then wasn't available in long pieces like it is now, uh, so it was painstakingly put together. Much different equipment, very simple equipment, old wood derricks and lifting equipment and train tracks on the bridge to, to push concrete carts out on. Uh, it was a much different time of construction when you used a lot more labor and a lot less equipment. Also innovative for the time was the construction of the channel span without the use of false work. Historically, bridges under construction were supported by temporary wooden structures, but the Lake Champlain engineers had to keep the channel open to lake traffic. So the engineers devised a system of cantilevers mounted on the channel piers and suspended each of those cantilevers outward to the point where they actually met. It's very difficult to calculate how those stresses are being distributed throughout this long continuous truss. And that's why the Lake Champlain Bridge becomes so important. It's really the first bridge to use that continuous truss 
technology for highway bridges in a special way to create a graceful transition between the approach spans and the arching through span. And cantilever designs can both extend span length uh, and also reduce construction costs. Despite the challenges of an innovative design and some untested techniques, the bridge engineers and construction crews worked through a cold Champlain Valley winter and, remarkably, completed the construction of the 1929 bridge in just over 14 months. As the final pieces of steel connected at the top, the foreman called the company engineer and said, the holes don't line up to get the bolt in. And he said, well, uh, it's morning. This afternoon, with the sun on it, it will expand enough so they will be fine. And they were. On August 26, 1929, 40,000 people gathered in celebration to witness the historic dedication and to take part in the grand opening ceremony. I never thought about going over. We used to watch them build it when we were kids walking along the shore fishing here. Then my mother come up and says, uh, put your shoes on, we're gonna go across the lake to see the bridge that opened up. My uncle rode us over and we went over in a rowboat and then we went inside the, one of the forts. And that was the first time I had ever seen a parade, I guess. And I remember the car that the two governors rode in with the top down and these two very important men waving at people, you know. <laughs> Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt from New York and Governor John E. Weeks from Vermont met at the center of the bridge to symbolize the uniting of the two states. There's uh, thousands of people there. And uh, even the Vermont side was packed. I was amazed. I mean, I, I never see that many people. On opening day, the public was allowed to cross the Lake Champlain Bridge free of charge. But the next day, toll collectors began collecting tolls at the single booth on the New York side. The charge was significant, a dollar a car. Sometimes it was a little difficult to get the money to go across the bridge. I remember people pooling their money, especially during the Depression, uh, to go across over to Vermont. Sometimes when we had guests from New York, my father would roll a boat over to Crown Point to save the dollar. For 58 years, the Lake Champlain Bridge Commission operated the bridge. In 1953, tolls were reduced by half to 50 cents. By 1956, the commission had collected enough in tolls to pay off the bonds. Still, toll collecting continued to pay for maintenance costs and bridge personnel wages. We were like a uh, tourist bureau. We would tell them about Lake Placid or what route do I catch to get here? What's this over here? Well, that's Fort Crown Point. What's this here? That's Fort St. Frederick. We just did all kinds of things. Jack of all trades we were. Residents took pride in the bridge. They would call the toll house when they noticed a light bulb out at night. As the bridge began to age, the tolls were not enough to pay for the major rehabilitation needed on the Lake Champlain Bridge. So, in 1987, the Lake Champlain Bridge Commission was abolished. Ownership was transferred jointly to the New York State Department of Transportation and the Vermont Agency of Transportation allowing the states to use federal funding for repairs. After the uh, toll was eliminated, that really freed it up for people to uh, go back and forth on a regular basis, and it really opened up the local economy because people were free to live in one state and work in the other. When the uh, bridge was uh, first opened in 1929, it was advertised as having no delays and a great way to visit the uh, historic places in the region. Over time, the use of the bridge evolved, and local residents and businesses on both sides of the lake began to depend on the bridge. As the mining was active in the Port Henry area, the uh, people would import meat from Vermont. There just wasn't the number of animals in New York to, to supply. There was a milk plant in Crown Point, so a lot of the milk was brought across to Vermont. 
And then, of course, there was always the logs that were going one way or the other. Some went down to the paper company and some were coming this way to local sawmills. The bridge was the ideal location for people to come through. It gave them that, that opportunity and definitely made a difference. For many residents, the Lake Champlain Bridge was much more than a structure that provided a transportation link. It was a constant and reassuring presence. When it was new, there weren't so many big bridges and you didn't have television, you didn't see pictures of, of things like that. So it was unique really to this area and it figured very largely in people's lives. To me, the, the bridge was a, little, a lady that I knew and everything was referred to by the bridge or near the bridge. At the kitchen table, uh, we spoke of it you know, as the bridge not the Crown Point Bridge or anything else, but the bridge, and it was almost like saying our bridge because it, it truly was a member of our family. On the bridge's 70th birthday, Hollywood would introduce the bridge to a broader public. Hot. Director Robert Zemeckis began filming What Lies Beneath, starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford. The bridge appears as a landmark in the thriller and also serves as the movie set for several night scenes. As the bridge aged, it was becoming increasingly difficult to keep up with growing repair and rehabilitation needs. So the states jointly decided to evaluate the bridge and develop a plan for its future. When we first were engaged in the project, we were only to establish whether the bridge should be rehabilitated or replaced. Uh, and my gut at the time was that the bridge would very likely be rehabilitated, knowing how important the old bridge was to the region. In the spring of 2009, a bridge inspection showed many areas of deterioration on the superstructure, and repairs began immediately. But that fall, very low water in the lake revealed something of much greater concern. Uh, some of our inspectors were riding a boat out to inspect some of the repair work and noticed deterioration in the piers. Um, the main reasons we feel uh, that the deterioration occurred was really twofold. Uh, freeze thaw conditions, some water actually gets into the concrete and as you cycle between the freeze and thaw temperatures, it can actually deteriorate the concrete and also ice abrasion you get ice that's actually moving against the piers and it basically scours it away. NISDOT typically inspects uh, foundations, uh, piers, every five years. So we were scheduled to have it done in 2010. At the last inspection in 2005, there was only about five inches of concrete that was deteriorated. But in 2009, we noticed 18 inches. So it, it went in an exponential fashion and we were very concerned with, with it continuing at that rate. We did some testing, we took some cores, noticed that there was some significant cracking in the piers, and um, we made a joint decision with the state of Vermont to close the bridge suddenly on uh, October 16th, 2009. When the engineering assessment was received, the state agencies of New York and Vermont responded swiftly. I was in the kitchen cooking and we were very busy. And then all of a sudden my waitress comes out and she says to me, she says, you're gonna come out here and see this. And the place was just emptying out. I was like, what? And she goes, um, a gentleman just came in and said, we were gonna get across the bridge, we better leave now because they were shutting it down indefinitely. Business owners, commuters, and farmers were presented with an instant nightmare. Well, not bad. They shut the bridge down. Uh, we got word uh, earlier today they found some kind of damage on it so they shut it down. And when it came official, the traffic flow just stopped. I closed the doors here because I knew without the bridge traffic, I was dead in the water, literally. And I heard the bridge was gonna be closed. Kind of panic. And how do we get from here to there safely? and maintain the animals were the first and foremost concern. Well, for 9,000 years, there was a busy crossing here, and then all of a sudden, we were at dead end. With the bridge closed, motorists faced over an 80-mile detour. Some businesses were forced to close their doors. A few people resorted to crossing the icy waters in small boats to get to their family or to work. 
but most lined up for hours at the small Fort Ticonderoga Ferry, 12 miles to the south. The ferry is at least a two-hour wait, and to drive around is 85 miles to go through Whitehall and come up 22A, which is in Vermont. The impact that it had on the community was so far-reaching that, uh, you know, I, I would have never imagined that, that it would have reached into so many people's lives as deeply as it did in, uh, in regards to, you know, their employment. Uh, many of those people work in jobs that, you know, pay $10, $12 an hour. New York and Vermont held public meetings in communities on both sides of the lake to hear concerns and to convey possible solutions. The message from the public was very clear. We need a new bridge, we need it here, and we need a way to cross now. Meanwhile, engineering studies showed that while the 1929 bridge could be repaired, it would be very costly, would not guarantee a long-term solution for the crossing, and most importantly, would be very dangerous for workers because of the risk of collapse. So it wasn't really until these really serious uh, structural issues became recognized that it changed from being a long planning process into the states went into a crisis mode and quickly made a decision um, to demolish and replace the bridge and all of the other options then were off, off the table. When I heard the news uh, that the states had made the decision to demolish and replace the bridge, it was like getting sort of stabbed in the chest. It, it just really felt like um, an old friend, a wonderful old friend, was about to die. They had a countdown to five, four, three, and then two, and then one. It went like pop, 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 like a bunch of pops, like firecrackers, and you could see it all uh, blown up on the, going across the bridge. And when uh, all of a sudden, just one big terrific boom, and, and uh, you look, and uh, all the bridge just dropped immediately into the lake. When the button was pushed and the bridge went down, the overall reaction was I just went, oh my God, it's really gone, and I just started to cry. With the bridge gone, people stood in awe. For most onlookers, it was the first time in their lives they had seen the unobstructed landscape. Hearing the strong public voice for relief, the states responded by designing and building new ferry docks next to the bridge site in record time. Construction moved quickly, surmounting winter cold and soupy lake soil challenges, while protecting valuable and fragile historic resources. The new ferry service opened on February 1st, 2010, just three and a half months after the bridge was closed. A project team led by a New York engineering firm, HNTB Corporation, began working immediately on the design of the new bridge. Lead design engineer Ted Zoli grew up nearby in the Adirondacks and understood the attachment that the region had to the old Lake Champlain Bridge. I've never in my career had more involvement from the public, more interest in a project uh, than this project by far. In the middle of December, at a series of public meetings in Ticonderoga, New York, over 600 people came out to hear about the bridge alternatives and to express their preferences. Over that weekend, about 3,500 people responded to an online survey. I can tell you that the mundane alternatives were ruled out immediately, that the more iconic bridges were the only ones that were worthy of consideration, and that this modified arch that echoed the shape of uh, Spofford's bridge was clearly the favorite of the public. I don't see how they could have really done it any better. And it resembles the old bridge just enough to please people, I think. It's a beauty. In my mind, there really isn't any way to truly replace the 1929 bridge. And uh, we have forever lost a very important work of American civil engineering, and there's just no uh, getting around that. But the designers of the new bridge have tried to do a similar thing to what Spofford and others in his firm did, which was to design a bridge that responded to this remarkable setting and also responded to people's interest in having something that was really beautiful and remarkable there. People want to feel 
like the region is whole again. And that's what happened in losing the bridge, is that the, the region was cut in half. And I think we really realized, maybe for the first time in a very tangible way, that we're actually not New York and Vermont, but we are interconnected and the, and the bridge is what uh, connected us together. The ironic thing is, when the bridge went down and we had to deal with it being gone, we became more connected between the two states than we had been when the bridge was up. And we have said all along the way in this journey, we are two states but one community. And that's been proven over and over and over again. And we hope to never forget that. All the men had their hats on, the women with the long dresses down to their ankles, and um, children running around, a few dogs barking. It, it was a great day. I, that was one of the greatest days of my life. The first time I remember going over, I was with one of my uncles, and he stopped right out on the very top. And I remember how excited I was when my mother came after me a few days to tell her about it. When the bridge was first built, it was just an amazing phenomenon. Over time, it just became one with the landscape, and it was ethereally beautiful. Sometimes you just, you just gasped when you saw it. 